All right, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining for today's webinar, Colonies Investment Area, New Mexico. My name is Shantaria Charleston, and I will be the host and the moderator for today's call. If you've not already done so, please ensure that you have access to both the audio and video portion of the webinar. To access the PowerPoint for today's call, please refer to the meeting confirmation email. All participants are in listen-only mode, which means your line is muted. However, we are very interested in your questions as well as your feedback. So to submit a question or comment, please use the chat box or the Q&A box that will appear on the lower right-hand side of your screen. We will attempt to answer as many questions as time permits at the end of today's webinar. So we have just a few folks here on the line today. Many of you are familiar with HAC. Some of you may not be familiar with HAC, but just a really quick brief overview on the Housing Assistance Council. Uh, the Housing Assistance Council is a national nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. that seeks to strengthen rural communities across America through investment and assistance with affordable housing and community and economic development activities that advance rural prosperity. So with a mission to improve housing conditions for the rural poor, HAC places an emphasis on striving to serve the poorest of the poor in the most rural places. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about HAC services or products, or if you have general questions or require assistance, please contact us directly by phone or by email. The contact information for our regional staff as well as our national office is currently being displayed on the screen. That information will also be a part of the handouts and materials from today's webinar. Also, please mark your calendar and make plans to join us for the following trainings. We've got a Section 502 packaging training that's coming up in Lansing, um, Michigan, August 6th through 8th, as well as our next uh, webinar on Colonial Investment um, in, for Arizona that's taking place on August 7th. So please mark your calendar um, and plan to attend. Again, thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Colonial Investment Area in New Mexico. I'd like to welcome and introduce our speakers for today, Kelly Coffey, Sam Lipschutz, Lance George, and Keith Wiley. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce our first speaker, um, Kelly Coffey. She's a product manager for Duty to Serve Initiatives and Rural Housing over at Fannie Mae. Kelly is responsible for the management and strategic development of Fannie Mae's single family rural housing initiative, as well as the leadership and execution of its underserved market plan under the Duty to Serve final rule. Her work includes serving rural markets, underserved populations, and housing innovation. Our next speaker for today is Lance George. Uh, he's the Director of Research and Information here at the Housing Assistance Council. And so uh, Lance's oversight of the research and information or policy analysis encompasses a wide range of issues here at the Housing Assistance Council uh, related, to, related to affordable housing, um, including manufactured housing, poverty, and high need rural areas, rural definitions and classifications, mortgage access and finance, and general uh, demography mapping and data analysis of rural people and their housing conditions. Our next speaker is Sam Lipschitz. He's the product development manager of uh, multifamily affordable initiatives with Fannie Mae. Sam manages the strategy and execution of various housing program initiatives in the multifamily rental space, specifically projects focused on serving the needs of rural communities. Sam's work also includes strategies for addressing the challenges in workforce housing, the preservation of existing affordable rental housing, and support for environmental sustainability. Our last um, speaker is none other than um, Hack Keith Wiley, um, our senior research associate. And so Keith works extensively um, with many data sets, HMDA, ACS, census um, in an effort to better understand where, when, and how development patterns occur. Um, his areas of interest include rural housing and development, smart growth planning and policies, and environmental economics. And so with that being said, I would like to go ahead and turn the webinar over to Kelly Coffey. Great. Thank you so much, Shantaria. Um, so as uh, Shantaria has said, my name is Kelly Coffey. Um, I am leading all the rural initiatives here for Fannie Mae, but there's a very good chance that you may not have heard of Fannie Mae and maybe less of a chance of what we do and how we operate. So I just want to spend 30 seconds on um, explaining this out a little bit more. So 
We've been around for a long time, um, since 1938. We were founded by Congress during the Great Depression, and the ultimate goal was to stimulate the housing market by making more mortgages available to low um, and moderate income home buyers. Fannie Mae does not originate or provide mortgages directly to home buyers, but instead we partner with lenders and organizations such as yourselves to provide the leadership, expertise, resources, and ultimately create and purchase mortgage products. So while the Colonius region continues to make improvements and great strides in regards to infrastructure and um, the ability to be building better quality homes, there is still a significant amount of work that still needs to be done to address some of these challenges uh, faced by the residents within these communities. But this is not work that Fannie Mae can do alone. We thrive on partnerships and collaborations and want to work with the best partners, which is why we're excited to be partnering with the Housing Assistance Council. HAC has highly knowledgeable and experienced staff. They're well-versed in everything from housing to uh, the federal housing programs, rehab, um, and research. So with Fannie Mae being a leader in the housing finance uh, area, we are committed and dedicated to serving some of the most underserved markets. In addition to us wanting and needing to do this work, we also have regulatory commitments that provide just, just the background for everybody to become involved. Uh, we want to be able to provide the tools, the resources, the technical assistance, to organizations such as yourselves to make home ownership possible. So I'm really excited to be able to offer this um, webinar to you today. And with that, I'm going to hand it off uh, to Lance. Thank you, yeah. Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. Um, and we appreciate your support and partnership and interest in this in this important topic. And I'd really like to additionally thank everyone else um, who's joining us today, quite frankly because that's the that's the impetus for this discussion you guys many of you we targeted um, um, professionals and and housers in New Mexico because you kind of live work um, and are experts in this community and can help us provide feedback on this issue we wanted to int introduce this concept of colonia investment areas that we've been working on and we really value your feedback if not today and in the future this is an ongoing dialogue this is a somewhat at the same time, it's simultaneously, I often say, complex but relatively easy um, endeavor. As many of you know, the Housing Assistance Council has been engaged in rural America for nearly 50 years, and we have, a, have had a particular attention on high-need, high-poverty rural communities, and we've worked in the Colonia just as long, sometimes on a daily basis, um, through an array of activities, uh, investments, training and technical assistance, and we're excited to be re-engaged on kind of a, a research and policy format to help inform sound policies and strategies. But what we really wanted to do was introduce this concept of colonial investment areas that really at the heart of it is to help direct more efficient uh, delivery of resources and investments to these communities and to rethink about this issue that hadn't had some thought for some while. Um, just some general background, and I know we've targeted this audience today to an, an expert community or a community with a lot of expertise, so many of you know much more about Colonia than I know I ever will, um, but just a, a general overview of, of Colonia communities, um, and again, they're a focus with HAC, but they are a form of development uh, largely located along the U.S.-Mexico border, um, and in many instances, they're defined by what they lack, um, and, and, and those are around development, lack access to potable water and sewage and infrastructure, and then some shared indices of, of poverty and economic distress. Um, so I don't want to dwell a lot on that. I really want to jump into the heart of what it, the definition of what is a colonial uh, investment area or how we're thinking about that. But one central element to a colonia is how it's defined. And sometimes I used to say, we often get this question at HAC, how do you define various things or various elements? Uh, a more notable one is just how do you define rural? And I used to say, I'll have to say from personal experience, I used to say it really doesn't matter. And now I've really changed my tune. I've learned over many years of this that um, actually how you do how you define something in many respects matters a lot, especially around resource development. Um, so one central, there are many definitions of colonia and it can be confusing. One central element uh, and the most commonly uh, identified or used definition of colonia, and there are many of them, believe me, in the course of this work, we found many of them, 
um, is the Cranston Gonzalez, the 1990 Cranston Gonzalez Act definition, which in essence uh, identifies communities 150 miles north of the U.S.-Mexico border. So the illustration below basically shows that for the entire border region, those shaded areas indicate 150 miles north of the U.S.-Mexico border. This is just a quick insight into um, uh, an interest into that area. Now, did I say this is not wrong? And this is looking at New Mexico, and we've added a couple of other layers there. Those are counties, the red areas are counties within 150 miles. The shaded area is the actual 150 mile designation. And we have a much lighter element which looks at census tracts, which at the end of the day, we'll talk a lot about census tracts and where those intersect. I hope to, we hope not to make this conversation too technical. Luckily, we have our lead researcher, Dr. Wiley, who can explain these issues much better than I am or I do. But uh, we hope to avoid some of the technicality and get to the crux of what does it really mean was it colonial investment area. But that's just some background on how colonies have traditionally been defined or largely been defined. And that's not to say this is not wrong, but um, in the course of this work, we have um, we have kind of a mandate and we just have, you know, the question is, and there are basically two questions here that I'm going to present. The first of which is up on the slide, why reinvestigate the definition? Um, and some of that relates to what's called duty to serve. I don't want to go into detail about duty to serve, but Kelly mentioned various regulatory um, uh, requirements and oversights, and this is one of them. And in essence, it is uh, that the that the enterprises, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, are have a duty to uh, kind of serve rural communities, specifically high need rural communities. There are other basic markets that they need to have a have a greater interest in but in this context it's in high need rural communities and colonial communities have been identified in that component so within that rule there's actually a specific designation um, which of those communities or how they define those communities for greater investment um, and access to mortgage liquidity and in actually a section of the rule it basically says a colonius is identified as a community that meets the definition of a colony under a federal state tribal or local program now, if you go back and read the entire rule, it gets a little more complicated than that. But in essence, they provided that framework. But unlike some of the other high need areas, that's all they provided. They didn't give a list like they did in many of the other areas. And, and thus, the onus is on the enterprise themselves, Fannie Mae, to identify those. And that is easier said than done, quite frankly. And I think that's where our engagement had come in, some of our expertise and our work, um, to look at identifying those communities within that context. And then that leads to basically this concept. The other major question I would say, what is a colonial investment area? And quite simply, I'm going to steal some of Keith's thunder here. A colonial investment area is quite simply a census tract that includes a colonia, that actually has a colonia. And there are a couple of reasons. There are three core reasons, and we'll get into some of these elements of geography. But there are three core elements or reasons why we, we identify or we brought together this concept of a colonial investment area at the census tract area. And uh, two of them are quite technical. The other is, I would say, more adaptive, and I wouldn't call it esoteric, but it's, it could be debated, but it's not, as, is, is not as specific. One of the technical elements is, quite frankly, under the duty to serve uh, requirement, most of the parameters are around the, the universal building block or the geography block in that program is the census tract. Um, and not to get into too much detail, but a census tract is a level of, of statistical unit that is uh, a smaller unit, It is, a, but it's not the smallest. So it's below a county, um, but larger than a census block. Um, and again, we can answer any questions that you have specifics on that. So it's a granular, it's a more precise definition, but it's not too low. And it is the basic, it's the core building block of many of the assessments of, of duty to serve, many of the components of duty to serve. And quite frankly, it's explicitly mentioned in the, in the rule. So that's one major reason. A second major reason and a, that we use the track as the basis of a colonial investment area. And we'll, we'll illustrate this to give you a better idea of what we're talking about. But it's quite frankly, that is one area where we have statistical reliable data. So if you go below that, um, we simply, areas of unit of analysis below that, say the colony or a street address, we don't have data to help develop the definition and or basically assess any 
uh, programmatic activity after that. So the census tract is the lowest level of geography where we can provide, where we can access good data or information on mortgage activity or various social, economic, and housing characteristics. So it's very important at that element. That's the lowest level. If we don't have those data, we're really throwing darts in the dark. We don't know what we keep, we're doing. We don't know how to develop it, and we also don't know um, how to evaluate it, quite frankly. And then the third is, quite frankly, um, uh, a, a more general component of a of the colonial investment area, the concept is the commodity or the service that's being provided. So basically, under under duty serving, as Kelly noted, what Fannie Mae does is they purchase loans. That's a core element of what they do. Um, so if you're talking about some other service or some other commodity, say water, waste water, or providing sewage or something, you might want to go to a lower level of geography. But for this type of investment, um, the tract is the most feasible for, for a couple of uh, technical reasons, but also general reasons. So I think, and this is, um, you know, not a very technical researchy term, but we looked, tried to look at, use the premise of the Goldilocks um, approach. So not too hot, not too cold. We didn't want it too small, but we didn't want it too large where it could be diluted, quite frankly. And there could be credit given or resources allocated areas where there weren't, quite frankly, colonia, or it might not really address the core underlying issue. And now I'll just get into a couple of the technical elements, and I'll try to go through this as generally as, as, as possible, although some of it is technical. And I would invite my colleague, uh, Dr. Keith Wiley, to weigh in on this. He and his team did most of the work here, um, and it was a lot of work, I'd have to say. But um, the, the first element of uh, – we really took a four-stage process in developing the Colonial Investment Areas um, from a geographic perspective, and those are identification, location, aggregation and compilation. So to quickly run through those and give you a, just an idea, the first is identification because it mandates in the rule that you have to use a, a publicly recognized list of colonia. So we compiled those publicly identified lists from HUD, USDA and EPA, the state list, and local municipalities. And these are, this is just some additional language that you can access in the PowerPoint afterwards. I know that's a lot of wordage, but basically those are uh, links to some of those data sources and more technical documentation about behind them. And as you'll note there in the, in the slide, the, the bar charts, that shows you basically how many colonial community in New Mexico they were identified. And I'm going to stop and back up here a second. I failed to kind of mention this, and it will become salient as well when we talk about geographic building blocks. But we are focusing today's definition solely on New Mexico for a reason. Oftentimes, the colonias, in our perspective, is viewed as a monolith, all four states together. And I think Keith would attest to this. What we found in our preliminary research and over and over, that there is a lot of variation by state for colonia. So they vary uh, in how they're defined and actually how they locate and exist and their characteristics a lot by state. So the Texas colonias are different than New Mexico colonias, and the same for Arizona colonias are different than California colonia. So we really did want to focus on states, specific states at a time in developing this. Now at the end, we are developing a master list, but it was very important to us to start at each state. That's an important component that I think is overlooked in many of these analyses. But when you go back to New Mexico, we basically identified these number of colonias, somewhere between 140 and 150 between the different sources. Many of those were overlapping. They identified the same colonia. But at the end of the day, we identified 165 total colonia in New Mexico from those sources. And you'll see this is just an illustration of, of the list. And I'm, we put this up here to illustrate a future point, but it's basically, you know, these colonia name on a list. Um, and for example, you know, um, basically Happy Valley Colonia, and it, we just provide a basic list of those. And this is part of the making of the sausage. The second component of that, if you'll remember, was to locate the colonia. And sometimes I think this could get confused with what's the difference between locating and identifying a list. And this is a huge distinction. Those colonia, just to identify them, oftentimes they are solely a name on a list. It'll just say X name of colonia in Dona Ana County or not give any geographic specificity. It'll just be a list on some name with no XY coordinates, no street address, doesn't tell you what county, nothing. And that's where a lot of the work, quite frankly, came in here um, with Keith and his team was um, not only identifying, chasing down the names of all of these colonias, but actually plotting them on a map. That was, quite frankly, 
most of the, a lot of the work um, was getting that between that step. We'll introduce a couple concepts here between points and polygons and just underlying geography. Um, I'm going to defer possibly to Keith later in this, but just a, an important point about points and polygons. Um, a polygon is the orange shaded area in this map. So a polygon is a geographic area where we actually know the boundaries. That's a very simplistic definition. And a point is we know that um, the Rockhound um, colony is located there, but we don't know its physical boundaries. And in the course of this, we got both of these types of data. So we know the actual point. It might be what we call a centroid. It might be in the center of that colonia, but we don't have the boundary data. And for some other colonia, we actually know where the boundaries are of the colonia, and those are shaded in orange. It's just a important it's distinction. We let really Keith worry about this part of, of the of this uh, of the of the investment area. Um, or the making of the sausage, I should say. He, he's, he and his team are best at doing that. We just wanted to identify that. And then finally, the building blocks of geography for this. So basically, as we noted before, we identified the colonia, but to make the colonia investment area, we need to aggregate up, and that's the third process, would be to aggregate up by census tracts. And as I noted before, most importantly, we did this each state at a time, each state individually, quite frankly. So it's in, in some respects, it seems very simple. We are simply identifying census tracts, I mean a colonia. So these orange areas in New Mexico, the, I, should, I should identify, the black lines are the actual census tracts. The orange identified areas are actually the identified colonia, so the, or I should say the located colonia. We had to identify them first, then locate them. And then ultimately, we aggregate up to the census tract and the shaded light tan tracks in this illustration show you the colonia investment areas. Those are based very simply a census tract that has a colonia located in it. And if you wait, if you take back away the aggregation and you take back away the colonia, at the end of the day, this is the product. These are the colonia investment areas where there should be targeted resources because there are colonia in these in these census tracts at a relatively small unit of geography. Um, that you can also analyze uh, and provide some technical elements of mortgage finance and purchases. The final stage is compilation. Um, we're less in, uh, I think that's less important for this conversation because we really did want to focus in on the state of New Mexico. But um, the, at the end of the day, we'll take all four states and compile them. Because we're using different data sources, we have to, what I would say, smooth or normalize the data. So it's all one consistent set of data because that is the, that is the charter or the mandate, quite frankly, from Fannie Mae's regulator, but also to help them in their service provision. And then we link it to other social and economic data so you can have even richer data or knowledge about these particular areas. Um, and at the end of the day, I might even ask Keith to weigh on this, but the, the, the total tally, and this gives you an example of looking at the total number of census tracts in New Mexico in that 150-mile border region. And at the end of the day, we identified 58 census tracts that, in essence, are now what we would classify as colonial investment area. And those include about 13.1% of the population in those areas, quite frankly, um, and about 58% of in, in the entire, they make up about 58% in the entire uh, border region. Um, so I know those air, those figures can get a little confusing, but in the at the end of the day, we identified about 58 um, colonial investment areas in New Mexico alone. And the final slide, again, this is just a reiteration of those New Mexico colonial areas, but we did want to give a little color to the descriptive statistics. And then I'm going to turn it over to Keith to provide you more illustration of uh, what those communities look like and some of their social economics and particularly mortgage characteristics. But this is just a color shaded map to show you the concentration or the number of colonies. So the darker the tract, the more colonia it includes, quite frankly. So the lighter shades have fewer colonia and the darker shades, the darker shades, and it's a scale in between one and then more than seven. So those darker colonies in the more western part of the state actually have them have more colonia. Um, but at the, it's, it, it's also important to note um, that there are many in Don Anna County. I think Keith can talk about that as well. Uh, there's, an, there's an element of kind of the ge geography here is playing as well. But at that point, I, I really did want to um, turn it over to Keith because he and his team have done some amazing work here. This is a, a lot of work. He, they make it look simple with these maps, um, but a lot of underlying work. 
And then I'm going to turn it over to Keith uh, to explain or to provide some data and research that we've done on what they actually look like, some of their some of their characteristics. So Keith. Uh, yes, thanks. Thanks, Lance. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about the preliminary analysis here uh, that, that we've done on it. And uh, uh, and I think it's a really interesting project. And we've uh, and like Lance did a good job of going over the process of locating the clonia. Then we identified the blocks that contained at least the clonia. And then we aggregated up to the census track to the clonius investment area, clonia investment area. And what we we did here is initially I wanted to get an idea of what it looked like these these communities look like relative to the uh, other parts of the state uh, and gets and basically in most of the research there's a lot of you'll see on the colonia there'll be a demographic characteristics analysis so I tried to do that here uh, and this is an aggregate but you can see the blue bar is for the U.S. Uh, and the next uh, uh, the light sh shaded orange bar is for New Mexico and the bar the darker shaded orange bar above that is for the border region and then the the the, the bar on top the the the, uh, the brightest orange bar is for the colonia and what you see here is this is looking at ACS data and you see that there's uh they're much they're more likely rural of those 58 census our colonia census area census tracts there's about 41 are rural, so it's it's very rural, and that's not always the case in some of these states like Texas and stuff in California. Uh, it's got a relatively large uh, Hispanic population, 57.3% uh, compared to 173 for the U.S. and 48 for the state of New Mexico and 55 uh, for the border region. Uh, it's a it's a, a bit younger in aggregate. Uh, there's a larger share of it under the age of 18 at 25.4 compared to uh, 24.1 for the state and 23 for the U.S. And there's uh, more poverty there, uh, 24.7 compared to uh, 20.9 for the state and 15 for the U.S. And these are kind of things we, in the literature, we'd expect we might see, but I just wanted to run them to get an understanding. And again, this is an aggregate, and I want to do some more work looking at the individual uh, investment area tracks too. But uh, the next next slide I have here is I we also wanted to look at the housing characteristics similarly, and again I know it's a lot of information, but again the bottom bar the blue bar is for the U.S. Uh, the next orange bar is uh, lightest shade one is for New Mexico. Uh, the next one up is for the border region, and the top one is for the Colonia Investment Area. And again we see things similarly. There's a higher home ownership rate uh, actually in the Colonia, which you kind of might expect uh, because this just refers to homeowners and renters, right? So there's more homeowners there. A lot, some of it's because it's rural, but also even uh, it's just a, that's how it would be categorized, uh, even if the, you know a certain loan type is involved. Uh, the next one I found very interesting, and I'm sure this is, I find this fascinating, is there's a huge amount of manufactured housing there. Uh, in the U.S., it's about 5.7%. Uh, for the state of New Mexico, it's 15.6%. Uh, for the border region, it's 24.1%. But for the Colonia Investment Tracks, it was 318 which is really, really high. Uh, I know that's actually another part of the duty to serve as well. Uh, I just find it very fascinating, and that has a lot of other implications. And it makes some sense when you think about it, right? If it's a sparsely populated area, it can be very difficult or expensive to build stick-built housing. So, you know, this makes some sense, and it's also a lower cost housing option, but we'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, but it's really fascinating, uh, it, and it's really high in the state and particularly in that region. Uh, the number of, uh, uh, the percent of units that are less than $10,000, uh, and again, this is ACS data, but you can see it's, it's a bit higher in the colony at 4.3 uh, than the region and then, then the state at 3.3 and 2% for the U.S., and then the number of units without plumbing uh, was 1.1%. And that might not seem high. And New Mexico is high at 1%, but the U.S. rate is 0.4% of all units, occupied units, lack plumbing. And there's also in the literature some talk that some of these estimates could possibly be a little lower. But in general, it's what you might expect, right? There is a high home ownership rate, but there's a large number of units uh, that, that lack plumbing. There's also a large number of units that are less than ten thousand dollars in value so this is the, again these are things we might expect to see 
So next, and really the, the main part of what I, I really like to work with and a lot of these things is the mortgage loan data, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data. And so we pulled the data from 2015 to 2017. And this is essentially most loan applications in the U.S., especially for larger lenders, uh, are reported here. And it put, gives uh, loan information, loan characteristic, or borrower characteristics, uh, the lender characteristics. And what I wanted to do and what I'm doing right now is trying to compare the activity for the areas inside and outside of the colonial investment area to see if we can find patterns and different commonalities. And here I'm just going to talk a little bit about the amount of lending, borrower characteristics, and loan type. And I do want to bring back up, Lance brought a really good point here. This data is collected at the census track level. So, you know, it kind of does in some ways mean that you kind of have to have it aggregated to that level to use this data. And it's very, very useful data. And, uh, so I'm just going to go over uh, some of the information here uh, that I have. And again, it's an aggregate, but I, I pulled an annual average of loans and I standardized them. Basically, I just said loans per thousand owner occupied units so I could compare across geography. And the blue bar again is the United States. And you see there was uh, 100, essentially 100, 101 loans per thousand owner occupied units. But in New Mexico, as a state in total, it was down to 72.5. Uh, and for the, the border region of New Mexico, it was about 64. And for the Colonia investment area, it was 61. And for the rural part, it was 49. So you see there's much less activity. First of all, there's a lot less activity in New Mexico. And then there was a lot less activity when you get to the Colonia investment area. And then when you get to the rural part of the Colonia investment area. Now, some of this makes sense, right? Because there's probably less loan activity in rural areas. So maybe that was driving it. So this, the next slide, just to show you, uh, I, I did the same thing. I just took the border region and the triangles are for the part of the border region that wasn't an investment area. And the squares are, orange squares are for the part that is. And you can see there's more activity. It's the same, same metric. There were 68.7 uh, loans uh, per thousand owner occupied units uh, outside the border region, not in an investment area, but there were only 62 for the investment area portion. And if you look at the rural, it's even more pronounced. We already know that it was 49 for the rural colonial investment areas, but outside the colonial investment areas, it was 62 loans. So this is just a way to standardize it. And you can see there was a lot less activity there, which I find very interesting, uh, you know, why that may be. And another, another element we wanted to look at was Hispanic or Latino lending uh, because they make up a majority of the population uh, in the border region and the colonial investment area. And so this is just a pretty standard approach. I, I did some other figures, but to be honest with you, they're kind of difficult to explain. Uh, but what I did here was each, each geography, I have a light orange, which is just their share of the owner-occupied units, Hispanic, Latino share of the owner-occupied units. And then the darker orange bar is the Hispanic or Latino share of the home purchase originations, you know. So thinking, you know, that we compare how much of the home ownership, the owner-occupied stock they have compared to the home purchase loans. And you can see there's a difference the whole way uh, from New Mexico is about 39.5% of the housing stock uh, is Hispanic or Latino, but the, the uh, home purchase originations is just 35%. And that difference consistently goes clear on out to it gets the biggest in the rural part of the Colonia investment area where it's about 37.5% of the uh, owner occupied units are Hispanic or Latino, but only about 29% of the loans uh, in those areas. And this is probably even a bit of an underestimate because I think actually the, the, the darker orange bar should be a little higher than the lighter one. If, they're, if the population's growing, then their share of the loans relative to their share of their unoccupied units, you'd think. So it might actually be a little bit more of a difference than what you see on here, actually. Instead of them being maybe better, that they should be even, it may, maybe the darker one should be a little higher, the, the, the orange one saying they, there's more loan activity than their share of the unoccupied units. But it does show that there's much, if you look at the other data, you also see that there's much more, there's a limited amount of lending there. And now I'm gonna to return to this because I think it's, it's fascinating and it's a, it's a really big, big issue here, uh, is the manufactured homes. Uh, and we talked before about the huge number of uh, manufactured home loans, if you look just in the ACS data. So I pulled the, the, um, the mortgage loan data. And again, this is an annual average. And you can see that there's the U.S. total, New Mexico, the border region, and in the Colonial Investment Area. And I did the same thing. I, I have the light, light bar, the orange bar for the, 
for, for the whole area and the dark orange bar for rural because there's a huge difference here between rural and the whole area. And if you look at the U.S. total, what this essentially is saying, 1.8% of annually of the originations, uh, and this is all of them. I pulled uh, home purchase, uh, home improvement refinance, involved a manufactured home. But for the rural, and this is duty to serve rural, it's 6.3% for the U.S. And that makes some sense, right, because manufactured housing is primarily a rural housing option or some suburban. But you can see that the, the, the difference uh, in the two. And then what I wanted to show with this figure is you can see it just keeps stepping up, right? New Mexico, 5% of the, all the originations annually were involved in manufactured home, but 11.5 for rural. For the border region, it was 9.6. But for the rural part, it was 13.8. And then for the investment area, it was 12.6. But for the rural part, it was 18.5. Uh, and now why this is really interesting and, and you know really important is because oftentimes uh, you know it is a low cost housing option but oftentimes it, it's a high cost loan right because these loans are, are uh, personal property or like a like a car loan uh, and so uh, you know it can, when you look at the humda data about half of all or a little over half of all manufactured homes are classified as high cost loans so it, it, that's a really interesting thing. And it's also part of the duty to serve as well. And I just had a, another figure here that I think does a good job of illustrating what's going on. Uh, this is a map of the ACS data. And, I, and I'm sure you are more aware of this than me uh, uh, if you're from that region. Uh, you can see it's by counties. The red line is within 150 miles of the border. So anything below that line would be in the, essentially the border region. And you can see uh, to the to the the west of Las Cruces, uh, there you can see a lot of those counties. If it's if it's dark blue, it has basically a third or more of the occupied units or manufactured homes uh, according to ACS. And you see it's very there's a lot of them, and that's essentially driving these numbers. And so I just think it's really interesting. And I think a lot of that's probably driven by the you know maybe you know uh, the, the area itself. It's it might be easier or it might be very difficult to get a stick built home there. But I think this is this is fascinating where like the two things kind of come together, the colonia areas over there, but then also this. And as I was saying, uh, this kind of goes right into another um, uh, figure that I have. A lot of times the loans end up being high cost loans uh, involving manufactured homes. And so I have the same figure here. It's not as pronounced maybe as I thought it might be, but if you look uh, for, I have each geography and the lighter uh, orange bars for the total area and the darker ones, just darker orange bars for the rural part. And you can see like for the US, 5.9% of all the originations were high cost, uh, but 8.9% were in rural, 59 for the nation, 89 for rural. And again, you see this difference the whole way up through. And a lot of that is being driven by the manufactured housing, but you can see you get up to the colonial investment areas and 11.1% of all the originations were high cost and 14.1% uh, in the rural part of the colonial investment area. Uh, and I did do some analysis with this. It's just the taking the manufactured homes out and there is still a difference. Uh, so, but it's not as pronounced, but it's, it, again, you, you, where you find a large number of those loans, you'll find a, a relatively high cost loan. And I should say, I, I didn't define it. This is high cost loan is defined by Humda, which it's like, I think for a first lien, it's 1.5% uh, above a prime rate loan. Essentially, it's a loan with higher interest rate over the threshold that triggers this classification. And one last figure that I'm that I'm working on right now, and uh, this in particular, I'd, I'd, I'd love to get some more insight on this, um, uh, uh, is in Humda, they have the loan by loan type. Uh, and in this case, it's by conventional loan, FHA loan, USDA loan, and VA loan. And I've broken it down by geographies. And again, this is aggregated, but the U.S. totals at the bottom, the New Mexico total, the New Mexico border region, the New Mexico colonial investment area. And a few things stand out. I put the numbers above so it would be easier to follow because I was actually getting the numbers in the in the bars and I was getting lost myself too. But what it says is essentially 66.5% of the U.S. activity during that period was considered it was a conventional loan. And the remainder was a government loan with 21.5% FHA loans, 
2.9% USDA loans and 9.1% VA loans, right? And these are originations. And if you compare it to the New Mexico, the New Mexico border region, or the colonial investment area, you see there's a good bit less, there's about 10% less uh, conventional lending there uh, of all the loans that were made. And there's uh, more uh, actually uh, FHA and uh, VA loans in those, those colonial investment areas and the state, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think what's going on, I think, first of all, I was, there's, there's a large, like, Fort Bliss is there and stuff, so that might be driving a lot of the VA numbers. And I also think uh, part of the reason for the, 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 the smaller conventional loan is just in general possibly the, the lack of loan volume there, right? Uh, so in other words, that they're lacking conventional lending. If we looked at the loan per thousand uh, owner occupied units we see there's just less activity and that might be reflected here right that there's that the, the, that it's not necessarily that there is a high higher share of government lending but it's related to the lower share of conventional lending uh, and i will also say that i did not that the colonial investment area if you break it down by rural and everybody else you get a slightly different different breakdown as well there's fewer fha loans a small percent and the rural colonial investment areas as opposed to the colonial investment area that's not rural, which is interesting. And I've also seen that in some of the Texas data as well, um, uh, I, which I think is interesting why maybe there's just less FHA activity there than what you might think, especially the rural parts. So in the conclusion here, I'm gonna just kind of summarize what I was, went through and reiterate a little bit of what Lance did. Uh, you know, there's a large number of colonia, relatively speaking, in, in New Mexico. I mean, I know Texas has by far the most, and I think most of the time when people talk about this, they talk about Texas, right? Because Texas does, uh, Hidalgo County has 40%. There's 2,000 in Texas, but, but there are a good many in New Mexico. And in fact, we found out that over half the census tracts in the border region in New Mexico have a colonia in their colonia investment areas, and that is the second most among the border states. Uh, so it wasn't necessarily, uh, you know, it wasn't really, it wasn't that rare. It was more common than what you might think. Uh, and oftentimes they tended to be rural, uh, duty to serve rural, that is. Uh, and that's not always the case, uh, like I said, for other places like in Texas, Hidalgo uh, County, most of that wouldn't be rural. And a lot of the stuff in uh, the, the ones that are in California wouldn't necessarily be rural. Uh, there was a large Hispanic a Latino population in the colonial investment areas. And that's actually like Lance was saying, I think another point that he made is very good. Each one of these is different. So in California, that's actually not the case. So they're kind of a little different and some of them are on Native American lands. And so they're all a little bit different. But in this case, it was a majority uh, uh, Hispanic Latino population and a very high number of manufactured homes. Uh, that's a, at, at least in part related to it being rural but also I think uh, a very important uh, important feature because it relates to lending uh, activity and also the duty to serve as the manufactured housing aspect would come in there. Um, in general, there was um, very limited mortgage lending activity, relatively speaking in New Mexico in general, but then when you get down to the border region and in the colonias, it got much less and the, the lowest levels are in the rural areas uh, and with the Hispanic rural bars, it got lower. I didn't put that figure in. Uh, and Again, manufactured housing is probably having an impact here as far as related to when you look at high cost lending and stuff. Uh, it's a large share of the, the loans, about 20% almost in rural areas. So one out of every five originations there annually was involved in manufactured home. Uh, so I think that's, that's really interesting. And also the breakdown and distribution of loans by type. Uh, but, you know, I think there probably still needs to be you know, improvement on more information, understanding. I think Lance did a, you know, Lance was great when he talked about like, you can have a point or you can have a polygon. And some of these cases, like the actual boundaries is diffi difficult to, you know, locate. Uh, so the information can probably still improve a little bit. Uh, but I think the duty to serve has done a, a really good job of focusing attention on this issue and these efforts. I know if you look back at the literature about 2004 or five or so, this issue kind of went off the policy agenda. Now that may have been related to the to the financial problems and the mortgage crisis, but from NAFTA in the early in late 80s and early 90s through the 90s, it was a, probably a much more talked about issue. And 
there was like the Cranston Gonzalez Act, and there was a lot of efforts focused towards it. And then it kind of, I think there during the 2000s, some point kind of became less on the agenda. And I think the duty to serve has put it on the agenda. That and other things like the USDA DA has a, and the EPA had a big project where they identified, uh, uh, you know, did an assessment on the border where they identified these communities. Uh, um, we used some of their work here. Uh, and so did the University of New Mexico uh, Bureau of Business and Economic Research. It was just a lot of great activity, a lot of great work. But I think now it's coming back, and I think the duty to serve can really be, you know, is, will be a catalyst for this and help even improve the effort. So then, you know, when you're comparing characteristics, maybe that the, you know, better target the investment, better target the activity, and then the characteristics are a little better. They're not kind of one-sided as they kind of are here. So I'll probably uh, turn it back over to Lance, and uh, and he can, you know, but we're looking for feedback and uh, next steps um, um, to, to go. And I would, I, I really, any, you know, the information would be great. Your, your, your expertise. Thank, thank you, Keith. Um, and at this point, um, I would just like to to thank Keith and his team. They've done an immense amount of work here. I often say this is on the iceberg principle where. You only see the tip of the iceberg. It's not really relevant, I think, to New Mexico Colonia, but you only often see the tip of the iceberg sitting out of the ocean, but there's a large body of work underneath this um, uh, because there just wasn't much data and not a lot of clear data. So Keith and his team have done an immense amount of work to help inform this issue, but also hopefully the end goal is to help inform greater investment and activity in these communities. And I'm going to kind of pull back from there and say um, we know some of these uh, issues might be complicated, so we're more than happy to take any technical questions, but we really like your feedback. We're doing these sometimes from computers and offices, although we've done a lot of outreach ourselves, talking to municipalities and local experts. We really want to take this opportunity to take any questions um, that you might have. And just to let you know, this is not a static um, or one-time affair. Um, we are willing, this is an iterative process, we're willing and we want your feedback uh, now or over the course of the next couple of months while we're still working on this before we kind of solidify some of these issues because we wanted to get get it right quite frankly. So thank you Keith and then we'll we'll open it up Terry if that's okay for any any potential questions that we might have received. Sure, thank you Lance, thank you Keith um, for the presentation. Um, we have just a few questions that have come in. I'd like to encourage everyone to start thinking of questions for Keith and Lance as well as um, the staff at Fannie Mae. And so the first question that we have is, are colonias ever defined as an entire town or census designated place? Oh, yeah, I can, you know, th that's an interesting point that, that I think Lance was talking about too. Each state is unique and different. So in some of these states, we did find that like maybe in California, the ones defined would be more like, say, a Bombay Beach or something. But then when you get into Texas, it would be a block in a town. So that's one of the challenges with this, right, is that they're almost not comparable across states, kind of. So within Texas, it seems like they're very similar. Uh, but uh, but but like, you know, and, and it is, but in California, they're different. And so it, it, that's really kind of a you know, th that, that does happen, uh, and it does vary by, by state, kind of, that they, you know, it all depends on what they would consider it. And I know in, in Texas, it's more kind of restricted to, like, certain blocks and neighborhoods. And when you get into, like, Arizona and uh, in California, it tends to be, I think, a bit larger, uh, more of the town, which is really gets into the issue of it. That's where when we're trying to say how much colonia is in a particular track, Colonia or colonia investment area, it's hard to do right because it's hard to know sometimes the exact boundaries. That's why we counted the number uh, to hopefully, you know, give us at least some metric to say we think there's more activity here than there. But without, you know, they're measured a little different. It can be a challenge. All right. Thank you, Keith, for that uh, answer. Uh, the next question, and uh, I'll again encourage everyone to be thinking of questions and answer them directly into the Q&A box that's on the right-hand side of the screen, the lower right-hand side. So the next question is, do you make a distinction between metro and outside metropolitan areas like the HUD definition does? Well, uh, 
yeah for uh, for this we 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 use the duty to serve rule to separate the analysis out at the census tract level but but that is true uh in the the hud definition uh actually uh, they uh it it's the all area within 150 mile of the border but then they exclude uh areas with over a million uh people uh in in part of a metropolitan area with a million people so like technically parts of los angeles are within 150 miles of the u.s border so or san antonio or at least the metropolitan area so in the hud definition they would just say that can't be uh for our analysis of these states we we kept anyone in that was identified we just labeled it according to the duty to serve definition uh which i think is uh you know is is probably an interesting and a, and a good way to a good way to kind of tackle the issue uh and and oftentimes too when i think about stuff like this is like Lance said, it's not it's not static, it's dynamic too. So in many cases, you might have some of these communities that have been there for 20, 30, 40, in the case of California, 50, 60 years. So they may have actually been built when it wasn't metropolitan, when it was when it was more rural. Because I think a lot of times, especially the ones in Texas were built at the fringe, right? Uh, because housing and land prices were so expensive and you could get cheaper land at the urban uh, rural fringe but now over time developments overtaken it so it might be part of a metro area which i think is a whole nother interesting dynamic to this uh and uh you know lance might be able to, to speak to it a little bit but yeah we we didn't we used the duty to serve rural definition but i think it it is an interesting thing to think about yeah and i, I would only add that was that was a kind of a good encapsulation by keith i would only add that the nexus of this is often a complicated issue but the nexus of of rural geography, I think is complicated in this, and it's somewhat unclear in the regulation, and we're still trying to parse that out mostly through what does the analysis tell us. That's the way we do things um, as researchers, um, and we'll let um, other people kind of uh, parse words over meanings within regulation and code, um, but at the same time, I would say it's just important to note in these analyses that Keith presented and that Hack is presenting, we did not, we analyzed the difference between rural and not rural, but if they met the definition of a colony investment area, those, we included those, so they would include non-rural territory as well, quite frankly, unless I'm wrong, Keith, but I think it's important to note that distinction that our main focus was on identifying the colony investment area, and some of those areas could be perceived or could be metropolitan or, non, or non-metropolitan. We just looked at the difference between rural and urban. Yeah, yeah, we didn't restrict anything. And uh, one, one not directly related, but I think an important point about is um, when we looked at the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data, that's th- there could be people getting loans outside that market. So that would be an important thing for us to know as well, right? Because the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data uh, is essentially like reported by banks and other things, and it's mortgage loans. But we're, I think maybe some of the Texas work, there was some talk that, you know, just because, you know, maybe it's not going through a bank, there's also credit, maybe it's payday lending or some other type of lending that's going on in those areas. That might be interesting to know what the, because we capture part of the market, but that's a, that, like the mortgage lending part of the market. I'm always fascinated by is there some other market, you know, like if that's going on there where people may, like there's a limited amount of lending activity there, but does that mean people aren't getting loans or they, you know, are they going about it another way that we're just not capturing? So, sorry, that's a tangential and, thing. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I think that's an important distinction as well. And it's, a, there's a likelihood, right, that um, for the, 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 one of the overall themes is we don't see a lot of standard conventional mortgage finance in these areas. It's relatively low. That's why we need um, partners like Fannie Mae and others to kind of enter in this space to expand those opportunities. Um, and that's one of the primary goals. But it's, it's a given that um, that there's a, 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 probably a high element of non-conventional finance that is less consumer friendly. And that's one of the goals behind this, quite frankly, is to inform uh, strategies to move beyond that to so where consumers are uh, being able to access um, higher quality credit, credit, quite frankly. All right, thank you. Looks like we have a raised hand from Art out at TDS. And so, Art, I am actually going to unmute your line so that you you can ask your question verbally. So one moment, please. Art, are you there? I'm here. I'm here. Hello, guys. This is Art Maruho with Get Other Soul Housing Corporation. Um, a few things I, I, I want to put out there. Um, 
So this duty to serve, I think we've been at it for over a year now. I've been to some in the past. And you just touched it right now about expanding opportunities for limited mortgage lending activity. Where we're at in southern New Mexico, it is hard to find private banks that are willing to do mortgage lending in these areas. I know you all have the Home Ready program. It looks like a great program for Fannie Mae. Have you looked into that program and possibly retweaking it where it can fit colonial residents? For instance, Carol the Soul does self-help housing with USDA. At times we look for alternative financing on the permanent side. But we have a bunch of private banks saying that they cannot take the value of the sweat equity that's put into these houses as down payment. That is one big issue that we're up against. What can Fannie Mae do with the investors to entice that and provide a secondary market for that type of product? My next question real quick, so keep that one in mind. My next question, the Capital Magnet Fund, how much influence does Fannie Mae have with CDFI to basically when you go out for your proposal, which is open, I think, open is already open, in that if you're going to serve Colonia as part of duty to serve, maybe a couple extra points for that proposal. Because mm -hmm. we've tried to use that capital magnet fund. We've tried to apply, and believe it or not, it, 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 it's a tough proposal. It's a tough proposal. And we went in with three organizations, and we still couldn't score, especially with that leverage, that 20 to 1 leverage. That's, that's tough leverage there. Unless it's multifamily, you know, but single family, that capital magnet just doesn't seem to work. All right, Keith or Lance, would you like to respond? So um, this is Lance. I, I would hope that um, somebody from Fannie would, those questions were more directed at, at Fannie Mae, and I can't speak definitively about those other than um, um, I, I don't think that uh, on the capital magnet fund, they don't have much sway on how that money is distributed. It just comes from their proceeds. Um, but I think it's that's administered by the Treasury Department. So I'm, that's my understanding. Um, it definitely is related, but I don't know how much they have. I, I just cannot. That, that's what the call is, and we're documenting those questions. I can't speak specifically and don't want to speak to their product line, quite frankly. Hopefully, if uh, Sam or Kelly uh, can get back to you if they're not able to answer right now. So, But thank you for those questions, Art. They're, they're very valid, and that's why we're having these discussions um, because you're right. At the end of the day, the definition is that's what we're talking about today, but that's not the important part. The, the important part is the end result of the access of credit, right? And that's what this is moving towards. It is you, – and you know that. I, just, I would only add one point, Art, that this is only – one year, really, Fannie Mae and some other entities have not been engaged in some of these communities for a long time. I'm not making excuses. I just think sometimes it's a longer-term game, and we need your education and your expertise to help inform those processes. Um, but I don't. Uh, hopefully, we will start to see some significant activity. But I do think it also is potentially a long game. Hey, Lance. This is Kelly. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Thanks, yes. Kelly. Oh, yes, Kelly. Oh, great, 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 great. I'm sorry, I would have spoken up quick first, but um, uh, it just looked like Lance, you took the floor. So, Art, thank you so much for your question. And, um, you know, the question that you raise about sweat equity is top of mind for the work that we're doing here in single family. Um, we are kind of in a, in a research phase to truly understand the best way to be able to determine value of the sweat equity and how we place a dollar amount on that. So I would love to take this conversation offline um, to see, you know, how your program works. I know you said it's in partnership with the USDA. But any other type of kind of information uh, that you could provide will help me kind of be able to move this forward. Um, but I do think, to your point, the Home Ready could be a, a wonderful product if somehow we can compile it with, um, you know, the sweat equity as well as just any other ideas or, um, you know, thoughts that you may have because there's nobody better than you and your organization who can serve these communities. So I'd love to take this offline and um, see what we can do to um, propel some mortgage lending in that area. Thank you for raising that. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Um, there is one final question, and we are right at the top of the hour, so I'm going to ask it really quick and see who can address it. Um, 
if there is one issue or is there one issue that needs to be addressed or further explored regarding identifying colonias? Well, uh, it, uh, just real fast for me, this may be a technical, uh, just after doing a lot of work with this, it seems to be there's some debate about whether that status is a permanent thing or like if as water work and infrastructure are improved, whether you're still on the list or not. Uh, I found that very interesting because say if we, there used to be, there was a lot of work done in the early 2000s with the USGS around the Colonius monitoring project and stuff. And there was lists on then and Colonius. Are those still active lists or like it, you know what I mean? It's a dynamic process. And I think just to help define it better, uh, to get a clearer list, maybe clear out some of those those issues, I think might help uh, a little bit. Uh, I treated it as if once you were on the list, then you were, and that's how we did it. Uh, but, you know, I could see some kind of um, maybe some challenges there uh, about what, you know, what is and what isn't, uh, and is it a permanent thing and that kind of yeah, thing. I, I think that's a good point. I'm only going to quickly add to this. This is Lance. I think that's an excellent point by Keith, again, more on the technical side. Yeah. Um, but I think this is relevant, and we've heard this question before. Um, I think Keith was talking about, are they still colonious? Because many of them were identified in the 90s or 80s. But I think we are hearing, and I'll be honest, it's beyond our scope of work, but hopefully we could maybe move this on what we call new colonia, right? Mm -hmm. There are some states where these lists have stopped at a certain point, and there might be a community that is actually has a settlement pattern like a colonia, but for whatever reason, it's not being identified. Um, the Dallas Fed has done some work on this. So uh, that's beyond the charge that we're working at because we have to work on, you know, currently identified properties or for currently identified colonia. And some of those lists have just stopped. They've been stopped adding to them, but there may be new communities. I think that's beyond this research, but for the larger topic, I think it's an important salient component. Yeah, great point there, Matt. But yes. thank, we thank you all. Thank you, Shantaria, and thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Kelly and Sam and Fannie Mae for, for kind of your interest in this issue and supporting this issue. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you. So if we'll you have any insight, anybody? Of... Oh, I'm sorry, Keith. Go ahead, please. Oh, no, I was just going to say, if you have any insight or anything you want to talk about your communities or anybody on the call, just please let us know. I'd, I'd like to hear it, uh, but more information. All right, thank you, Keith, for that last word. Um, I'd like to thank Kelly, as well as Sam, Lance, and Keith for the wealth of information that's been shared today. Also, thank each one of you for your time and participation during today's webinar. Um, also, as we close, please be on the lookout for a really uh, quick survey um, that will contain uh, your certificate of participation. Um, but the survey is the most important thing. That is the way that we know that we're bringing the most relevant content to you and the work that you're doing in your communities. Um, with that being said, um, I'd like to wish everyone a very well rest of your afternoon. Thank you very much for your participation. Enjoy the rest of your day.